Hello, welcome. Thank you for clicking on this video. I am BH the Uncivilized, and I'm going to be talking about the film Snowpiercer. Um, now, just to start off with, this will contain spoilers. So, if you haven't seen the film, you may want to watch that first and then come back to this. Proceeding ahead, there are going to be spoilers being discussed in this uh, analysis. Um, now, Snowpiercer is a 2013 film directed by Jun Ho Bong. It is set in the year 2031, where the world has been covered with ice and the last remaining survivors of uh, humanity are living aboard a train with an eternal engine. The people are split up between the first class passengers and the tail end passengers or the freeloaders as they're referred to. Um, everybody has their preordained position depending on the ticket that they had previously to board into the train. Now um, a few things I want to talk about on this film. The main one is the re relationship between Wilford and Gillian in particular were they working together so what I'm going to do is go over a few key points throughout the film and then afterwards uh, give my uh, viewpoints on their relationship now all we really have is Wilford's word on the matter he mentions to Curtis at the end that uh, he and Gilliam were working together on these revolutions there's various revolutions that have happened we also see at the end of the film that there is a phone line that links the front end of the train to the back end of the train. When Curtis was talking to Gilliam near the beginning of the film and Wilford has mentioned the camera pans upwards and at that point we see the sign on the wall with the big W on it. At that point it just looks like a placard but we later on find that that is a secret phone. What's uh, significant here now is that Gilliam is sitting right next to that phone and also Gilliam appears to have his own space in the tail on the train. Everyone else on the train section, on the tail end section of the train, we later see are in bunk beds and they're all quite squashed together, whereas Gilliam clearly has his own space. So when Curtis talks about having late night conversations that go on for hours and hours, that seems very much feasible considering how much space Gilliam was granted next to this secret phone. According to Wilford, the revolution was supposed to end at the death squad. They were supposed to get there and then they kill each other, but then ultimately uh, any survivors go back to the uh, tail and the train. However, that doesn't happen. They do get past that death squad when they fight back with the uh, fire torches. After that scene, Gilliam and Curtis are talking and Gilliam asks Curtis uh, if he wants to proceed and he says yes. Um, and at that point, uh, Gilliam sits up and tells Curtis to not let Wilford talk and to cut out his tongue. It could be that as they were working together and Gilliam realizing that he can't stop Curtis from going forward, he needs Wilford not to talk about his complicity in the uh, revolution, so he needs him to kill him right away uh, and suggests don't let him talk, cut out his tongue. Also at a point a little bit earlier, Gilliam mentions that they only really need to get to the water car. Once they control the water car, they can control the fr uh, whole train and not have to go to the front. So again, perhaps Gilliam is trying to pre uh, prevent the revolution from going any further than it really uh, that it really was originally tended to. Whilst Gilliam and Curtis are talking at, after the death car scene, and Gilliam realizing that Curtis is still going to press forward, Gilliam does describe the front of the train as the having a, a big uh, a door with a W on it. Now that suggests that he's been there. All right, so I'm going to go back over some of these points just with a slightly different perspective to them. So I mentioned that all we have is Wilford's word, but what is Wilford's word worth? Wilford tells Curtis that he was the first person to walk the full length of the train from the tail end to the front. Now, considering that Gilliam described the front of the train, that suggests that he's been there, so perhaps he's not the first person. But even if Gilliam hasn't been there and just happened to have seen the front of the train, we still know that Wilford is a liar about that particular fact of Curtis being the first person because his assistant Claude we see at the tail end of the train when she collects the children, Andy and uh, Timmy. So we know at least three people 
have walked the full length of the train as we see them later on in the front end. So we see that there is a phone line that links the front end of the train to the back end of the train. And we also see that Gilliam is sitting next to where that secret phone is in his own little space. However, that in itself does not suggest that Gilliam knew about the phone. It could have been put there for emergencies or any other reasons. But the fact that it's there doesn't necessarily mean that Gilliam actually knew about it. From Wilford, we understand that the revolution was supposed to end at the death, uh, at the death squad car, and then there's various points where Gilliam seems to be trying to not let it go further than that. However, that could just be concern for the tell and passes. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were working together. So, what do I think of all this? Um, now, it really could be one or the other. Um, films like this aren't going to give you a definitive answer. There are always going to be clues that suggest uh, both sides. However, in my opinion, I do believe it leans more towards them working together. One of the reasons for that is that they both wanted Curtis to become the next leader, to take over the train. Now, if we look at Curtis's character, he is very much a natural leader. He's very focused and very determined. Also, he's very much uh, decision orientated. There's a part where he sees uh, Edgar being held by one of the uh, one of uh, Wilford's uh, henchmen, and then he sees Mason trying to escape. So he has a choice between either saving Edgar or catching Mason, and he chooses to catch Mason, leaving Edgar to be killed by uh, the henchmen. Later on, during the school scene, he very quickly gives the order to Gray to kill the teacher. And considering that the teacher is pregnant, um, that shouldn't have been such an easy decision. He then kills Mason, point blank, once he has no further use for her, while she's begging for her life and unarmed. Let's compare that to uh, Wilford's character. Wilford talks about maintaining a balance um, and the whole ecosystem. He talks about the, uh, having to control populations and being unable to wait for natural selection and thus having to have these more drastic measures where they are killing off um, multitudes of people to control the population. Although Curtis may not necessarily want to admit it himself, does have these likenesses in that he is willing to sacrifice people for the greater good should he need to and perhaps that's the type of character they're looking for they're both looking for to lead the uh, to lead the train another thing that i want to talk about in this uh, film all the parents in the film are presented as single parents tanya has a son timmy there's no mention of timmy's father andrew has a son andy there's no mention of andy's mother when Curtis is talking about killing Edgar's mother in the past, there's no mention of Edgar's father. And also, the only couple to be, uh, the only people who's presented as a couple aren't sh uh, shown to have any children. So we have single parents and uh, one couple with no children. That, at least that's how they're presented. That could just mean their significant others are elsewhere, or their children are elsewhere. Um, may not be specifically mentioned in the film, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're then in non-existence. However, I do think that is done delivery and perhaps it's something to do with the population control that Wilford talks about. So that is my analysis on Snowpiercer. Uh, let me know what you think in general. Do you agree with what I said? Do you disagree with what I said? Have I left anything out? Is there something I didn't consider? Let me know what you think. So please comment, uh, like, share, subscribe. Also, um, if you have a suggestion of a film or a video game that you'd like me to uh, an analyze, um, let me know. Um, thank you for watching and uh, take care.